In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful. Amen. 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 the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Amen. Let us pray, O God, by the light of the Holy Ghost, as instructed the hearts of thy faithful. Grant us by the same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary. St. Joseph. All ye forty holy martyrs, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So this is kind of a conference slash catechism. So um, I think we need a, a good dose of Archbishop Lefebvre in this age of so much strange doctrines and heresies and novelties. So let's hear some sanity from the great Archbishop Lefebvre, who was really a gift for our age. St. Pius V, for example, was a great gift for the age of the Protestant Revolution. And he excommunicated Queen Elizabeth. And the, mo the modern historians always blast him for doing that. But that was the right thing to do. And yes, did it cause more persecution for the Catholics? It did, actually. But it, it drew the lines clear on whose side everyone was. So let's look at Archbishop Lefebvre. Firstly, he's talking about the new Mass as a dangerous rite. R-I-T-E. Upon the impl implementation of the Novice Ordo in November 1969... So the Novice Ordo Mass came in, out in 1969, first Sunday of Advent. The priests came out in their parishes. People came to Mass expecting the altar facing the wall, expecting Latin, expecting the normal centuries-old Tridentine Mass. And then the priest came out in the morning and said, Good morning, folks, with the table in front of him. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the Mass of Paul VI. So we know from Bonini, who wrote the new Mass, that this new Mass was prepared in seven stages since 19, actually 48. But with the 55 and Holy Week changes, that was the first step to the seven stages to overthrow tradition at the liturgical level. Archbishop Lefebvre announced to his seminarians that he would keep the traditional Mass. He only uses the time given by Rome, which intends to make the reform compulsory only at the end of 1971. But on this date, he explains his refusal of the reform mass. Quote, if we ever took the Novus Ordo Misse, the new order of the mass, we would no longer have vocations. The tree would dry up as if we had put the ax to the root. So there's the first bad fruit of the new mass. It kills vocations. What, what man wants to sacrifice a beautiful wife, having his, his business, whatever it is, having a thousand children, for being a social worker, a glorified social worker, which is what the new mass turns the priest into. He's no longer there to offer sacrifice, but he's facing the people, and it's a man-centered ceremony. And it physically is. He's facing the people, which is so Protestant and so wrong. And in Archbishop Lefebvre, in, in his book, A Bishop Speaks, which is a treasure, he actually goes through the history of the Protestants, both in England and in Germany, how they introduced the new Mass of, of the Protestant service. And the, the main things that they did was turn to face the people, put the Mass in vernacular, in German, Germany, German, in, Eng in England, English, and uh, give communion in the hand and drink of the chalice and let the lay people read the epistle and sometimes the gospel. So does that sound like the new Mass? Absolutely. It's just a, a repeat. So... However, Archbishop Lefebvre still believes that when, a, when the faithful cannot attend an everlasting Tridentine Mass, he cannot dispense with the new Mass. 
as long as it is celebrated in a worthy and faithful manner by a worthy priest. This precision is important because in his theological and doctrinal acumen, the Archbishop Lefebvre denounced in 1971 the danger inherent in this reform with a Protestant tendency. And he says, we can therefore ask ourselves very legitimately, so, in so insensibly, the Catholic faith in the eternal truths of the disappearing Mass. Oh, it's a little bit clumsy because it's a direct Google translation from the French. The validity of the, of the Masses does not disappear also. The intention of the celebrant was that of the new conception of the Mass, which in a short time would be none other than the Protestant conception. The Mass will no longer be valid. Archbishop Lefebvre. So he's saying the danger is invalidity because the new Mass assists the priest in losing the faith. <laughs> it does. And <coughs> priests I've talked to who used to say the new Mass, they say, yes, you have to really think against the, the new Mass Missal to perform the sacrifice, which is not, in, it's not encouraged or highlighted in the new Missal. And then in 1973, he confirms this, Archbishop Lefebvre, it is understood that our attitude will become more and more radical as time passes, with the, the spreading of the heresies. In 1975, it brings this frightening precision. Archbishop Lefebvre says, all these changes in the new right are truly dangerous. Why? Because little by little, especially for the young priests who no longer have the idea of sacrifice, the real presence, transubstantiation, and for which all this does not mean nothing more these young priests lose the intention of doing what the church does and no longer say valid masses. Certainly the elderly priests, when they celebrate according to the new rite, still have faith. They still have the eternal faith because they were trained in the good old seminaries. They said mass with the elderly for so many years in their older age. They keep the same intentions. One can believe that their mass is valid. But to the extent that these intentions disappear, to this extent, the masses will no longer be valid. So, the, you know, he's saying just common sense stuff. The old priests formed in the old way, when they say the new mass, they kept the old faith like Bishop Sheen. His masses were still for sure valid. But sad to say, he did go with the new mass. He should have opposed it. But the young priests formed in the new theology, do you think they're do you think they have the real traditional idea of what the mass is? No. So um, some basic catechism questions. First, what is transubstantiation? Anybody? Don't don't be afraid to talk. What is it's a huge word. Trans substantia. Changing the bread and wine into the body and blood. Christ. Yes, into Christ's body. Yeah, blood, soul, and divinity. This is the miracle of transubstantiation, which takes place at what part of the Mass? At the introit, offertory, consecration, or communion? Consecration. And at what point, when the priest elevates the host? When he genuflects, or when he says the words? That's right, and that's Catholic. This is precisely Catholic. He has to say the words by a validly ordained priest who is ordained in the same lineage coming from Christ to the Twelve Apostles. So Archbishop Lefebvre could boast that his lineage was right from St. John through the St. Pius V, to Archbishop Lefebvre. And I'm a grandson of Archbishop Lefebvre in the, in the Holy Orders, so I could say my priesthood comes from St. John the Apostle, who housed Our Lady and said Mass for her. That's a be very beautiful thing. So, yes, so transubstantiation is the miracle 
of the changing of the bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And after that, you'll notice the priest always holds his fingers together. Why, anybody? Yes, because the Catholic Church teaches, the Catholic faith teaches us, when Christ said, this is my body, he meant the entire host. The bread, the substance of bread is changed entirely into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, leaving only the accidents. So it looks like bread, but it's not bread. So at Mass, when the priest holds the host up, the accidents are just floating there, but the substance is Christ's shining body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's quite beautiful when you think of how beautiful that is. So when the priest says the words at that moment, hoc est enum corpus meum, at that instant is the miracle. Then the priest does what? Altar boys? Genuflex. Genuflex. And then the altar boys do what? At that moment? Ring the bell. Ring the bell. Then the priest elevates the consecrated host or chalice, the blood, and then they ring again, and all the people adore. Then he genuflects again. This is so Catholic. And when you look at the missal, at this t time of the Mass, the rubrics in red ink, ruber means red, so the ru rubrics in the Mass show what the priest is supposed to do in his actions. There's about a paragraph of rubric, red ink, and then in big letters, the words of the consecration. Orchest enum corpus meum, period. All in big letters. And that's, the priest has to be drunk not to know that he's saying Mass following the old Missal. But in the new Missal, it all is the same lettering. It's read out like a narrative form. There is no red ink to say to the priest, stop here, lean over the altar, and say the words distinctly, slowly, and silently. And the new, in the new Mass, that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said it lends itself to invalidity. Because the priest could just think that he's just reading the Bible out loud, and it wouldn't even be a valid Mass. And then the new Mass, another dangerous heretical move, is the priest says the words, well, he doesn't even say it in Latin, this is my body, then he elevates, there's no genuflection. And they're, they're lucky if they have a bell ring. And then he puts it down, and sometimes genuflex. So that favors the Lutheran and Protestant heresy that says Jesus is there by the faith of the people. The people put him there. So if you... Joe Wing, if you believe Jesus is there, he's there for you. If Sally doesn't believe he's really there, but it's just a symbol, well, he's not there. So you see how subjective this is? So Protestant, so poisonous, so wrong. While with Catholicism, every particle is changed into the body blood of Christ. So every single crumb that falls from that host is the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. That's why the meticulous care taken to collect all the particles and keep the priest's fingers together and he only wipes them over the chalice after the consecration so no particles fall to the floor. Padre Pio used to take very great care in gathering every single particle. Very great care. You can uh, see also Archbishop Lefebvre sees in the Navasoto Mass a new harmful rite that cannot be obligatory. He comes to this conclusion in 1975-79. to 79. So Archbishop Lefebvre, at first, he thought, okay, look, boys, when you go home from, a, from, a, from Freiburg, at the seminary in Freiburg, where it started, try to find a priest that says Mass with reverence. So already the new Mass was in. But he changed that position very quickly. He changed that position and says, On May 5th, 1975, on the Feast of St. Pius V, Archbishop Lefebvre made the decision to maintain the traditional Mass at all costs in his seminary. His judgment becomes more categorical as to the new Mass. He said, The new Mass does not oblige for the fulfillment of the Sunday obligation. 
So that was a, quite a radical statement in those days. In other words, if you go to the new Mass, you don't fulfill your Sunday obligation. So it's in 1975, he tells people, sanctify the Lord's Day if you don't have the Mass. Sanctify the Lord's Day by reading the Missal, praying the Rosary, spending about an hour as you would at Mass. And he encouraged follow also a cassette tape. In those days, they didn't have live streams. So he had one of the priests send to a woman in Trinidad on the island where she had no Tridentine Mass, but she had conservative priests who wore their cassock, devotion to Mary. But he said, don't go to their Masses if they're saying the new Mass. It's too poisonous. But they said the words with reverence. They said a reverent new Mass. He said, stay away. And he sent a cassette tape of all things of a, of a Tridentine Mass. So now it's a little easier for people because you can actually follow the Mass on the live stream. I know it's not the best situation. We all know that. But what other choice do we have in given the circumstances we're in? On August 29th, 1976, in a famous homily sermon, he, he spoke in Lille in France, Archbishop Lefebvre did not mince his words and treated the new rite, calling it a bastard mass. He explains, quote, it is precisely because this union desired by the liberals between the church and the revolution, so he's talking about the Masonic revolution, and subversion is an adulterous union. Only of this adulterous union can come bastards, so illegitimate children from an adulterous union. And who are those these bastards? They are these are the new rights. The the right of the new mass is a bastard right. The sacraments are bastard sacraments. We do not know whether these sacraments give grace or do not give grace. So he's saying they're so warped and so objectively altered, you don't know if it gives grace. Archbishop Lefebvre says, later, we, we conform to the um, yeah, this is a bit rough, this Google translation is not so great. We conform to the development which is gradually taking place in the minds of the priests. If we conform to this we must avoid it. I would all, say almost in a radical manner, avoid all assistance to the new Mass. Only certain exceptions are permitted, and obviously for marriages, burials, and those kind of things. But he says also, you treat it like a Protestant service. You don't participate. No active participation in the new Mass. The following year, Archbishop Lefebvre again explained in the basis of reality the attitude be, to be taken with regard to the new Mass. He said, It is therefore dangerous, especially practiced when practiced regularly. It slowly corrupts the faith, slowly but surely. It is impossible, therefore, to attend only rarely and for grave reasons. By endeavoring to avoid all that would oblige us to make some odious concessions. Yeah, it's not a smooth translation from Google, but in other words, yeah, stay away from the new mass. It's too dangerous. This is a very important point here. It's an illegitimate right. Legitimate means that it's basically good for souls. Legitimate means that it's approved by the church. It's a, a right of the church and it's good for souls and it gives good fruits. But the new Mass, we cannot say, is legitimate. And Archbishop Lefebvre fought this word. It's a key word, and Bishop Fillet compromised on that word in the Doctrinal Declaration. That was a huge sellout. Huge. But legitimate is a key word, and Archbishop Lefebvre always held it's not a legitimate Mass because it's born out of a Freemason who wrote it with the help of six Protestant ministers, it's not a right of the Catholic Church. Pope Paul VI, at most, you could say, 
just printed a missile, his missile, and forced it on everybody in the church. And he's paying the price for that now. I, I wouldn't want to know what that is. In the third stage, beginning in 1979, Archbishop Lefebvre became more severe against the new Mass. So even he, it took a little more, it took some time to realize just how evil it really was. He presented this Mass as harmful to which one could not participate. In a note on the Navasoro Mass to the Pope, written in 1979, Archbishop Lefebvre recalls and clarifies the Society of St. Pius X's position with regard to the liturgical reform. He says, These new Masses not only cannot be the object of the Sunday obligation, but we must apply to them the rules of moral theology and canon law, which are those of supernatural prudence in relation to participation or assistance to a dangerous action, dangerous to the faith and possibly sacrilege. So all these goofy new masses that have happened are just open sacrileges, open sacrilege. And you saw, you know, recently the, the priest blessing everybody with an upside down guitar. <laughs> and then in Chicago, they had the, the it's just, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing to even say, priests in full vestments shaking their hips to rock and roll music inside the church. And they have mariachi bands playing inside the church and they swing to it. When Pope John Paul II visited St. Louis, Missouri, there was a whole gathering of Dominicans and they shouldn't have been in their habits. They never wear them anyway, but they did to receive the Pope. And there they were all, both nuns and priests and brothers, all of them swinging their arms and hips to rock and roll music. It's just shameful. Salt that lost their flavor. But this is the new mass nonsense. So Archbishop Lefebvre based it on canon law and obviously the light of the Holy Catholic faith. This reform, which springs from liberalism, from modernism, is entirely poisoned. It emerges from heresy and it ends in heresy, even if all its acts are not formally heretical. And he's talking about not just the new Mass, but all the new sacraments. So he was no friend of the new Mass, and that's why it's normal for Catholics, when you hear a traditional priest or a traditional bishop saying, well, the new Mass can give you grace, the new Mass can nourish your faith, your reaction that says, wait a minute, this is wrong, is a Catholic reaction. And we should be allergic to liberalism. That's a good sign of Catholicism. And yeah, you should be horrified to hear that kind of language and resist it, oppose it, because it is dangerous, because Archbishop Lefebvre never, never spoke that way. To those who oppose him that one cannot prevent the faithful from actively attending the new Mass, as long as it is valid, Archbishop Lefebvre answers now strongly uh, on the canonical principle that we have just stated. He said, let us immediately destroy this absurd idea that if the new Mass is valid, we can participate in it. In open brackets, parentheses, if it gives grace, obviously, yeah, well, if there's nothing else, I can participate in it. It sounds logical, right? And if there's miracles in it, all the more. It must be approved by God so I can go to it. And that's what told everybody Bayside, the so-called apparitions of Our Lady in Bayside, New York. That's what told everybody that this was a bad apparition. Because Our Lady said, supposedly Our Lady said, stay in your parishes. Which means stay in your new mass. Which means you'll end up losing the faith. And then your children will end up losing the faith and your grandchildren. And that's exactly what has happened in the history of the last 58 years. People who thought, well, I'll just find the most conservative new mass, their kids went to the liberal new mass and their kids just stopped going altogether because it's a joke and kids can see through the gimmicks. The priest coming out with rainbow stoles, the priest coming out um, in Germany recently, they had this 
Um, I think Michael Matt showed it on one of his talk shows, which are actually very good. His Catechol, what does he call it? The, the Remnant Underground. It's actually very good. And quite honestly, if you want to get the best news out there, one of the best news outlets, it's him. He's, he, he approaches the news in a very Catholic way. So I certainly encourage to listen to that. So uh, he, but I think it was there that he showed a new mass where a priest had in Germany, he had all the kids bring their bikes into the mass with their helmets and bikes into the church and bless their bikes. <laughs> anyway, the nonsense. So kids can see that gimmick and they just abandon the faith because the new mass is a joke. And even the priests know it. They know it's a joke. And that's why so many priests abandon their priesthood. You know, you, you can only support a lie for so long. So Archbishop Lefebvre, again, let us immediately destroy this absurd idea that if the new Mass is valid, we can participate in it. The Church has always forbidden attendance at Masses of schismatics and heretics, even if they are valid. It is evident that we cannot participate in sacrilegious Masses nor in masses that place our faith in danger. How's that for clarity? Of course, I don't need to convince you, but you youngsters need to hear it because, you know, you should be familiar with what the new mass is about. And it doesn't hurt to see part of one, either on a video or in visiting a church, see part of the new mass and realize the, that's part of the fight we're in. And it's invaded all our Catholic churches. That's why you're not going to your local parish church in wherever, the closest Catholic church around here. Before Vatican II, you could, because you'd find the Tridentine Mass and priests that taught more or less sound doctrine. But not anymore. They have the churches, we have the faith. Arch St. Athanasius. As for those who recognize the excellence of the traditional Mass, they, or say it, that it's merely better than the the old Mass is better than the new Mass. They are, according to Archbishop Lefebvre, so-called traditionalists. He says this, We do not accept this at all. To say that the new Mass is good, no. The new Mass is not good. If it was good, tomorrow we should t take it. Obviously. So if, it, it, if, it's, if it's grace-giving and it's valid, why couldn't you say it and go to it? So we have to treat it like a heretical service. And that's, there's no argument about that. Archbishop Lefebvre, there's no possible way to equate the Tridentine Mass and the New Mass. They are diametrically opposed. So when Bishop Follet in 2007 praised Summorum Pontificum of Pope Benedict XVI, he praised him for releasing the Latin Mass, but that's not what happened. And if he, if he was honest, he would re read the document and the letter before the document, which basically says, quoting Benedict XVI, the two rites of Mass, the Latin Mass and the New Mass, are both mutually enriching. So they complement each other. And he says, the old Mass we will call from now on the extraordinary form, and the new Mass will be the ordinary form. So if you say the new Mass, you cannot... Uh, if, you, if you say the Tridentine Mass, you cannot condemn the new Mass, because they're both mutual enriching rites. So that's like saying light and darkness are on the same plane. Christ with Satan is equally good. Lie and truth are equally okay. So that's the success of Benedict XVI was to, to deceive many souls into accepting Vatican II with Tridentine Mass vestments. Archbishop Lefebvre says, the Mass is the banner of the Catholic faith. The Mass puts aside all the errors of Protestantism, Islam, Judaism, Modernism, Materialism, Socialism, and Communist Secularism. There can be no mistake in our Holy Catholic Mass. The Mass is anti-ecumenical. 
the true Mass, in the sense in which ecumenism is understood since the Vatican Council. 2. The union of all religions in a syncretism of prayer without dogmas, without morality, without, with, without precise laws, agreeing on equivocal slogans such as the rights of human dignity, religious freedom. The new Mass, on the other hand, is indeed the, the banner of this false ecumenism which represents the annihilation of the Catholic religion and the Catholic priesthood. Wow! So the new Mass represents the victory of masonry crushing the Catholic Church. That's what it does. And the fruits show it. He also said in 1983, quote, that there are more than sufficient grounds for not conferring on it the titles reserved for the Catholic Mass forever. The, the eternal, the, the Mass of all time, regardless of the rites. Yeah, that's that's a, a bad translation in the Google thing. Finally, in 1985, Archbishop Lefebvre addressed all the puzzled Catholics in these terms, summarizing what we have just said. Quote, your perplexity then perhaps takes the following form. Can I attend a sacrilegious Mass, but which is valid, if there is no other, to satisfy my Sunday obligation? The answer is simple. These Masses cannot be the object of a Sunday obligation. We must also apply to them the rules of moral theology and canon law as regards the participation or assistance in a dangerous rite against the faith or possibly sacrilege. The new Mass, even if it's, if it's said with piety and respect for liturgical norms, falls under the same reservations since it is imbued with a Protestant spirit. So, um, no, no ambiguity there. So what do you think if Archbishop Lefebvre would tell you if you said, well, if the new Mass is valid and it's a pious priest, can I go to it? What's he going to say? What will Archbishop Lefebvre say, you know, your holy, your excellency, if the new Mass is valid, then it gives grace. Can I go to it to get that grace? What will he say? No. Why? Lose your faith. You'll lose your faith, and you'll lose all grace. Uh, in the Spiritual Journey book, page 13 in the English edition, he says very clearly, the new Mass does not pass grace. It does not give grace. Let's look at Archbishop of speaking of the fruits of the new Mass. Archbishop of Fev says, Has the, no the use of the Novus Ordo Mass, the central act of the liturgical reform, produced the good fruits expected of it, or has it had the disastrous consequences that might have been foreseen? The reply to this question will oblige us to consider the circumstances of this singular reform, unique in the history of the Church, and will, will enlighten us on our duty for the future. To assess the dogmatic, moral, and spiritual value of this reform, we must briefly recall the immutable principles of the Catholic faith on the essential constituents of our Holy Mass. One, in the Mass is offered to God a true and propitiatory sacrifice. So what is this sacrifice, anybody? Is it rams, cattle, sheep? What's this sacrifice? Is it just bread and wine like Melchizedek in the Old Testament? What's the sacrifice? Yeah, Christ on the cross. Is, is, the, is, the, is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross bloody or unbloody? No, no, be careful. It's extremely bloody. He was covered in blood from head to foot. But is the sacrifice of the cross in the Mass reenacted? Is that bloody or unbloody? Unbloody. It's very important, these points. And we cover them, of course, with First Communion kids. But we always need to be reminded <coughs> because they're undermined by the new Mass. <coughs> Those who would deny this proposition are heretics, says the Council of Trent. For every sacrifice, there are needed a priest, victim, and a sacerdotal priestly action, sacerdotal action, by which the victim is offered. So in every Mass, you need the priest, the victim, 
and the offering of the sacrifice and the consummation of the sacrifice. So in the Old Testament, the priest was the Old Testament priest. The sacrifice was the lamb or the ram or the goats. And let's just take the lamb. They would stab the lamb through, drip the blood, tie it to a cross, and actually pierce through the rump to the head of the lamb, pierce another uh, stake through the shoulders, and hold the lamb high for all to see. And it looked like a lamb on the cross, prefiguring Christ. St. Justin is the one who talks about this. And then he says the priest would lower it over the flames. So what will that look, lamb look like after he holds it over the flames for 10 minutes and holds it up again? What's that lamb going to look like? It'll be bloody because the skin will break through and bleed. Yeah, it'll be black. It'll be very grotesque. But the Virgin Mary, when she saw with St. Joseph and Our Lady going to the Jerusalem for these sacrifices, I bet she, she was already weeping floods of tears because she knew exactly what that meant, right? She knew what it all meant. So this is Catholic. This is pure Catholic doctrine from the Council of Trent. And by the way, the Council of Trent condemns vernacular in the Mass, condemns changing the ceremonies of tradition. So the, the Council of Trent condemns the new Mass in every way. So for those who try to say, well, the Council of Trent defends that the new Mass can give grace and is always valid, well, no, because it condemned the new Mass, essentially. Point two, in the Mass and on the cross, the principal priest is one and the same and, and victim. This is defined, de defide divina catholica definita, that means this is dogma of the faith, which says in the Mass it is the same sacerdotal priestly priest, Christ, who is on the cross and is the victim. So Christ is the priest offering and he's the victim also on the, on the altar. Third point, the host and victim, the oblation and the victim, is Christ himself present under the species of bread and wine. That's defined in this, we must believe this or we're, her we're heretics if we deny this. There are th thus three realities ne necessary for the reality of the Mass. The priest, victim, and oblation. So let's see what Archbishop Lefebvre says about the danger of the new Mass. Apart from a few slight and accidental advantages, or should we rather say the one advantage that may come from the reading of the Epistle and Gospel in the vernacular, we may regretfully maintain that directly or indirectly the whole reform, which is the Novus Ordo Mass, attacks these three truths essential to the Catholic faith. It is not then a liturgical reform resembling that of St. Pius V, which is in question at the Council of Trent. It is clearly a new conception of the Mass. The reformers have made it no secret. For Archbishop Bonini's normative Mass, as he explained in his lectures in Rome, is simply that defined in Article 7 of the introduction of the Novus Ordo Mass. Everything laid down in this new order clearly reflects this new conception which is closer to the Protestant conception than the Catholic one. The statements of the Protestants who contribute to the reform illustrate the truth of this naivety and sadness. Protestants can no longer find anything to prevent themselves celebrating the new Mass. So the Protestants have no problem saying the new Mass. So that tells you it's from hell. We may therefore quite legitimately ask ourselves whether, as the Catholic belief in the essential truths of the Mass insensibly disappears, the validity of the Mass is not also disappearing. The intention of the celebrant will have a bearing on the new conception of the Mass, which before long will be no other than Protestant, and then, in this case, the Mass will no longer be valid. 
So how many novice order masses today are, do you think really are valid with priests formed in the new theology? Because the priests are told the bread and wine are a symbol of the Christian community. And the sharing is expressed with the kissing of the peace, the clapping of the hands, the laity reading the epistle, altar girls at the altar, they're all actively participating. That's the fellowship of the community. That's all Protestant talk. Well, at the Catholic Mass, there's no clapping, there's no talking, there's silence, and only the altar boys respond at a low Mass. And normally at a high Mass, it's, it's usually the, the choir. If it's laymen, they should be dressed in cassock and surplice, ideally, according to St. Pius X, and it should be the men, really, who are singing the Mass. Uh, women singing in the Mass is a far stretch granted by Pius XII. But Pius X's ideal was that a good scola of men chant. And it's quite impressive. And boys can chant the Mass as well. And the Gregorian is not easy, so they have to really work at it. And it's extremely beautiful. Now we must fully persuade that the Mass is not only the supreme religious act, but the source of all Catholic doctrine, the source of faith, and of personal, family, and social morals. It is from the cross continued on the altar that there come down to us all those graces which enable a Christian society to live and grow. To dry up that source is to do away with its effects. So the Tridentine Mass affects the city. And I've, I've seen it and I've heard it. Wherever the Tridentine Mass goes, there's, there's less crime in that city. There's more cleanliness. There's more order. It just affects the city. Archbishop Lefebvre said that in Africa, he saw the influence of the Catholic faith in the Mass. He says the cities became cleaner. The men became more faithful to their one wives when before they had many. And there was an influence on society. And the education of the young would have been based on objective reality and good formation. So the, in, the kids had a joyfulness. They had, you know, the, you could actually talk to a real person. And it's nice to see in most of our traditional Catholic families, you can actually talk to the kids and they look you in the eye and they respond with a, a rational answer. And, uh, and always respectful, of course, usually to the priest. I don't know if they're always respectful to their own brothers and sisters, but they always are to their priests. And um, while in most modern, real modern families, which does affect traditional families too, they're so involved in their computer games and cell phones, they don't know how to put it down. And there they are sitting with grandma and grandpa, and the grandma and grandpa want to talk to their grandchildren, but they're so absorbed in their games, there's no conversation. And even with their parents, there's no conversations. And I've heard of some families at table where they text each other right across the table. And, so, <laughs> uh, and this is what's going on, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse. And a lot of common sense is going out the window it really is. There's tons of examples for this, but, you know, opening the door for the ladies, respect for the elderly, that's all gone, going. What else is leaving? You know, at Mass, when a baby is screaming, bring the babies, that's fine. But if they are screaming at Mass and they can't, they're not stopping, you don't stay in the church. But some people think, I'm just going to stay and keep my screaming baby. But you do, you pray when you take the baby out so there's the people, the rest of them, everyone can follow the Mass. That's just common sense. But even this, people are losing. And mothers, when they nurse, you don't nurse in public. That's just, just wrong. You go to, a, and they usually use a blanket in a quiet, separate place. But today, even mothers are just openly, openly nursing their baby. If the nursing is good, even that's being gone today. So it's a good thing. But all these old customs of decency and morality and respect and politeness, 
It's all gone because of the destruction of the mass and the faith. And I'm just touching the surface. I mean, it's gone much worse. Now we must be fully persuaded that the Mass, is, says Archbishop of Febvre, is not only the supreme religious act, but the source of all Catholic doctrine, the source of faith, and personal family and social morals. The effects of the Mass, which are the fruits of the Holy Ghost, so eloquently described by St. Paul in his epistle to the Galatians, that the fruits of the Spirit are charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity or kindness, goodness, longanimity. What's longanimity, anybody? Longanimity. Long, of course, is long. Animus, anima, is soul or spirit. So it's long, we would say long-suffering. To be able to endure patiently the crosses. Or in a, in a, in a religious community, like St. Teresa spoke about the old nun behind her that drove her crazy. I've heard two issues, two explanations of this. Either it was the nun was banging her rosary against the pew without realizing she was annoying everybody. Or I heard one explanation was she had a dental. She had fake teeth and she was always chewing and you could hear it moving her dentures, and it drove St. Teresa crazy. For wh whatever it was, it drove her crazy. So she just offered that as a sacrifice and her prayer during the meditation time at the Carmelite convent. And so she offered that. But that's long-suffering. That's a fruit of the Holy Ghost. That applies also in marriage, to bear each other's faults and even sins and forgive. Be patient and forgive. Uh, goodness, goodness is a virtue, the fruit of the Holy Ghost, which seeks the good of our neighbor for their good. And that's what true love is, to seek the good of the other for the good of the other. A selfish love is to seek the good of the other to see what I can get from them. Like a salesman, how much money can I make from them? But true charity and goodness is to seek the good of the other for the good of the other. And that's the beauty of fatherhood and motherhood. This is what they're constantly doing. Good parents will constantly be forming virtue and guidance and correction and encouragement and compassion and all that. Benignity is kindness, which is to treat other people kindly. Even the worst, even the greatest sinners, you see our Lord with the woman of the cotton adultery, his kindness towards her. And he says, whichever of you is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And then he, uh, they all leave, starting with the elder. And then he says to her, there's no one here to condemn you? She says, no, Lord. Then he says, go, sin no more. Your sins are forgiven. So we see the kindness of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And when, in the Sacrament of Confession, you see the kindness of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Pope St. Pius X said the priest should be a lamb in the confessional. Very gentle with souls in the confessional. He should be a lion in the pulpit and roar the truth and roar against heresy and error. And then he should be an angel at the altar, said Pius X. And then patience. What is patience? It's, it's a sister to long-suffering. It's kind of the same thing, really. But what's patience? Bearing with hardship. Or... Bearing with hardship, adversity, faults of other people, crosses, yes. The root word of patience is patsi or pati, pasusum, which means to suffer. So a patient man knows how to suffer. And... To know how to suffer is true wisdom. Peace, which is pax, which is the pax is the tranquility of order, says St. Thomas Aquinas. Peace is the tranquility of order. So there is peace where there is order. Your car runs well, or your motorcycle or dirt bike, if there's peace among all the parts that work harmoniously together. 
the spark plug can't be the handlebars. That'd be stupidity. You, it'd be a, you can't run the bike. But that's what the modern world tries to do. Men are women. Women are men. men women are men. Children are adults. Adults are children. They want to blend everything together. There's no more authority. No more authoritative figure. And the Pope, with ecumenism in his head and collegiality, he becomes just one of his fellow priests and bishops and not the monarch of the church to govern and, and correct and excommunicate error and so forth. So that you have, you have disorder. Disorder. Imagine a dirt bike where the wheels are the handlebars, the handlebars are the wheels, the spark plug is the gas tank, and the gas tank is the spark plug, and the seat is the... The seat is the... Exhaust. The exhaust pipe. <laughs> nice yes. Huh? Nice yes. I mean, it'd be absolute disorder and it wouldn't function. But that's the modern idea of peace. It's, it's lack of order. But God put order in the soul, in the family, in society, in the relation of church and state. There's an order in a tree. There's an order in, in all of God's creation. There's order. That's why you see peace in his order. And man attacks this peace and wants to bring in the fake peace without Christ, and that's just not possible. Another fruit of the Holy Ghost is joy, the happiness of union with Christ by the state of grace, with the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in the soul. Charity, which is to love God above all and our neighbor. So these are the fruits. So these are disappearing from society, says Archbishop Lefebvre, because of the bad effects of the new mass. There is now division in all families. Religious congregations and parishes are attacked by the virus of disunity. Even bishops, even cardinals have been infected. The Catholic Mass had and forever will have the effect of raising men to the cross to unite them in our Lord Jesus Christ crucified, to weaken in them the turmoil of sin and the rebellion of sin which leads to division. If the cross of our Lord disappears, if his body and blood are no longer present, men will find themselves gathered around a lonely and lifeless table. There's the new Mass. Lonely, lifeless, and we might add, sterile. The new Mass is sterile. There's no large families anymore. And of course the priests all take the, preparing the married couples, what they call Cana, pre-Cana classes, they're telling them all how, how to practice NFP which is only for extreme emergency cases, and there's a lot of conditions around it. So it's not just Catholic birth control as they try to push it as now. Nothing to unite them will remain, Archbishop of Feb says. Of that, no doubt, are born from that is born the weariness and lassitude which are everywhere becoming apparent. Of that, the disappearance of vocations, so no more vocations out of the new Mass, but the true Catholic Mass breeds vocations, both of nuns, priests, and brothers. Because when a young person sees what the Mass really is, and the reverence and an adoration, he can connect to that. I can give my life and marry God and sacrifice my beautiful bride for the love of Mother Church, be married to Our Lady and the Blessed Trinity, and help him and Our Lady save souls from hell. You can connect to that. Sacrifice your life with Christ on the cross to save souls from hell. And if you don't become a priest, as a brother, you take, you give your life to God, you marry God to save souls from hell and help the, the work of the priest to save souls and spread the glory of Christ the King. And nuns, they, they can connect to that, that I will offer my whole virginity, my whole life, and the, the glory of having a husband and a big family, that's a big sacrifice for a decent girl. And when she sacrifices that to marry Christ and give her life to Him, united with the Mass, that just transforms society by her prayers, by her example, by her life and the sacrifices it's very beautiful, and it elevates society. When people in the pub, in the world see two nuns walking in full habit, or shopping in full habit, it's powerful. And it makes people think of God. It makes people think of 
the love of God and the nobility of women. So, and then the priest in the cassock, Archbishop Lefebvre gives a lot of sermons and talks about the importance of wearing the cassock. And uh, as I mentioned before, the communist countries get rid of two things first when they take over. Get rid of church bells, which are exorcisms over the whole city, and call people to mass and remind people of God. The second is priest cassocks. They're very powerful. And they speak the kingship of Christ. And the archbishop wanted his priest to wear the cassock. So uh, with the new mass, disappearance of vocations. And that's obvious. And the vocations they have are all messed up. Because usually they, bring, they, allow, the, they allow the weirdos and perverts to come in. And the normal guys who should be priests, who are manly and self-sacrificing and dutiful, they, they send them out because they pray the rosary. <coughs> the secularization and profanation of the priest from the new mass, who is no longer conscious of his purpose for existing. Of that, the desire for the things of the world replaces it. Little by little, by reason of this Protestant conception of the mass, Jesus Christ is leaving the churches that are all too often profaned. And then last paragraph, and we'll close here. The concept of this reform, the manner of its publication, with successive editions unduly altered, the way in which it was made obligatory, sometimes tyrannically as in Italy, the alteration of the definition of the Mass in Article 7 without any effect on the right itself, are all happenings unprecedented in the traditional tradition of the Roman Church, which has ever acted cum concilio et sapientia, with counsel and wisdom. They give us grounds for questioning the, the validity of this legislation and thus conform to Canon 23, saying, On a matter of doubt, it is not permissible to revoke a law, but the recent law should be considered in the light of the former and the two reconciled as far as possible. One thing remains as abs an absolute duty and right, the safeguarding of the Catholic faith. Of this, the Holy Mass is the most living expression and the divine source, hence, it's of primordial importance, the preserving of the Tridentine Mass. So, so it's, it's the life of the Church. And no wonder the devil attacked the Catholic Church at every level, but he knew if you attack the heart, which is the Mass, you cut the lifeline. And our father Malachi Martin used to say that also. The new mass doesn't give grace. There's no more grace pouring out to the world. That's why the rise of Satanism, immorality, abortion, divorce, the collapse of the human society, because there's no more grace. That's the fruits of the new mass. But the, the, the fruits of the real Catholic mass are growth, grace, and large families, vocations, morality, cleanliness, even in the city. So, you know, the police force, I've talked to many old police in New York, New York police, Los Angeles police, and they really used to appreciate the Catholic priests because the priests would preach about hell, preach about purgatory, preach about sin and judgment and and how we, had, we must not break the Ten Commandments. So when people hear this every Sunday at Mass, it stops crime. Because people start to have a fear of hell. If I start stealing my neighbor's property, it's a sin against God and I'll pay for it. And I could go to hell for this. So the Catholic, the preaching of the faith even helps the police force. They have less work to do because of the Catholic principles. So, so the, great, the great work of Archbishop Lefebvre and the great position he stood with that the new Mass is objectively doubtful now. It may be valid if it's proper matter and form, but maybe not if it's, not, if it's, not, if it's lacking any of these especially the intention. He said it doesn't give grace, it's sterile. And Father Pulvermacher used to say, look at the fruits of it. 
the sterility. This, you know, the Navasoto churches aren't packed full. And all these gimmicks and folk, rock and roll masses, folk masses, mariachi masses, polka masses. People see it and they see it's a gimmick. And, um, and Archbishop Lefebvre was right. He said, you, it does not fulfill the Sunday obligation. So what about the indult mass? Archbishop Lefebvre spoke a lot about that as well. He said, it's not good because those priests still have to accept Vatican II in the new mass. They cannot oppose their bishops who impose on them the Vatican II doctrines and they cannot condemn the new mass. And some of them say both, which is also a schizophrenia in the priest. So um, to conclude, what are the four purposes of prayer, especially in the mass? What are the four ends of prayer and the highest prayer being the Mass. Anybody know them? Praise, adoration. Adoration of God, yes. We adore God. Petition. Petition, yes. We ask God help and graces. That's in the collect of the Mass. And at the end of Mass, what's the prayer called? That last one before the blessing? The post? The post? The post communion prayer. So all through the Mass, the priest is petitioning. And when we say our prayers, we petition God, we adore Him, we petition Him. We Third? Him. Oh. I said we thank Him, that's the last one. Yeah, gratitude, yeah, gratitude towards God, that we be grateful to God. And this great bishop, uh, Ezekiel Diaz, he says um, forgetfulness of God is the, is the root of all vice and sin. We forget Him. And isn't that true? We usually sin when we forget God and live as if He doesn't really exist. We've sinned. So gratitude towards God. Always have great gratitude for everything. You know, the souls in purgatory and the souls in hell, especially the ones in hell, they realize just how grateful they be to just be able to see, to move freely, to drink a glass of water because they can't do these things anymore. So we need to be grateful to God for the least thing that we can do. If you can wiggle your toes, thank God. If you can think and speak and, and act and walk and reason and, and love, these are graces of God. So we'll always be grateful. Love Our Lord loves that in souls. And the Mass is full of gratitude towards God. Gracias a Jimus Tibi in the Gloria. And then lastly, anyone? Uh, there's, yeah, penance or expiation or atonement, all the, all the same. So we make reparation, we want to make reparation to God for offending Him. And the best reparation is in the Mass, you offer the face of Jesus, all beaten and bruised, you offer His five wounds, you offer His sacred heart. There's nothing more powerful, there's nothing more moving to God than his divine son on the cross, which is what the mass is. So no wonder when they, the devil has destroyed this mass, society is just collapsing to pieces. So adoration, petition, gratitude to God, and expiation or satisfaction or reparation. Same thing. Those four are the purpose of prayer. Any questions? Okay, we'll close with that. I'll give you a blessing. And... In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Saint Joseph, Saint Gregory the Great, Saint Benedict, all ye holy angels and archangels, Amen. Thank you, Father.